This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast. Today, exploring the hero worship of Michael Jordan and the dramatic appeal of the sports docu-series, The Last Dance. I'm Mark Linson Meyer, and first of all, there's no backstabbing going on here. I'm Brian Hurt, and it's time for me to move on. I'm Seth Paskin, the guest, and are the expectations for my presence on this podcast just way too high? And I'm Erica Spires, and the only question is, how long can it last? And for those of you mystified by those introductions, they are all, of course, from the credits to the Michael Jordan 10-part documentary series, The Last Dance. And if you're like me, you didn't actually watch the credits ever. So they're a mystery to me, too. Mark, what are we doing here? I thought we were going to just dwell on incidental qualities of the docuseries, like the fact that the commercials, which were unskippable in the way that I was watching them, all are very somber. And this is brought to you by State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And Reese's Peace, you know, that was the most exciting part. Boy, I'm so glad you took that away from the documentary. Seth, for all the things for you to join us on, I was, I didn't know this was your jam. What's your connection to this topic? Your NBA jam. (laughs) 80% of it is being asked. Mark hasn't asked me to participate in any of the other PMP episodes on any of the other topics, but I am a sports fan. He knows that. And I'm old enough to have lived through the Jordan era. So when I was watching the documentary, there were many things that just kept flooding back and it captured kind of the gestalt of that time period. But in terms of being an NBA fan, I'm not a huge NBA fan. I never really was a huge NBA fan, but I I was very interested in Michael Jordan as a person and as a persona, really as a character. You know, if you think about him as an international icon, that's the thing that really drew me in. I have many... Many strong opinions about this documentary, so. Excellent. I think we should all give our priors in terms of how we come to this. Mark, you're a big NBA fan. Tell everybody just how much. I will refer folks to our previous episode on sports for non-sports fans to, uh, for my background. I was present in the Chicago area while these things were going on. Let me put it that way. Erica, Michael Jordan superfan? Absolutely. It's the only game I ever really followed, except for a brief stint where I followed tennis because I had a crush on Pete Sampras. You like the eyebrows, huh? I don't know what it was. Isn't it weird? It's weird now, but yeah, I had a thing for him. I wanted to be a professional basketball player at one point in my life, which is hilarious, but I think a lot of kids did, and a lot of kids thought it was maybe possible. Not that we had the skills that Michael did, but he just, what he did was so ubiquitous, like Everybody knew about Michael Jordan and everybody knew about the Chicago Bulls and it was inspiring. And I practiced a lot. I was by myself a lot shooting hoops in my backyard. And when I hit about 15, 14, 15, I had to make a choice between whether or not I was going to continue playing basketball or if I was going to do theater. And I weighed my options and realized that I wasn't getting any taller (laughs) And more than likely, since I wasn't the star player anyway, it was probably like I I needed to hedge my bets on on theater. So I did quit basketball. But man, it was super fun. And I have great memories being on my basketball team. You might be the biggest basketball fan among the four of us. I, I mean, I'm from Chicago also, like Mark, and I'm a big sports fan. And the Bulls are easily my fourth favorite Chicago sports team, (laughs) though I will say for real, uh, for real. Being now a Chicagoan in exile, get a lot of pride from whenever a Chicago sports team does well, White Sox notwithstanding. So this documentary, we all saw all of it. True? False? True. True. Silence, Erica. Fess up, Erica. Okay, no, this is the truth. I was really into it for about four episodes. And then we got to episode six and we watched it and we were like, is this not very good? And we're like, I thought this was really good. We both thought this was really good. And then we're like, maybe it was only really good because it was COVID times and it made us feel good for like a hot second. So we skipped to episodes nine and 10. I read synopses of seven and eight, but I did not watch seven and eight. So that's kind of my hot take, I guess, if there is a hot take is I recommended it highly to people. I really liked it. And then I got to like episode six and I was kind of over it. I promise I'm not being a dick when I say you may have missed the two best episodes. Nuh-uh. 
Well, no, seriously, because I feel like seven is the episode where Jordan goes into the whole winning has a price and being a villain part of his life. And those are the episodes that also have his baseball retirement and his father's death. I thought those were really right. If I could recommend two episodes, it'd be the two you skipped. Well, damn it, Brian. Why didn't you tell me that before? I didn't want to cannibalize the podcast. (laughs) Seth, do you want to start us off with a, what is one of the issues that was picking at you in watching this? Okay. This isn't exactly an Iliad length catalog of ships of complaints, but let me at least list three. The first is it's good. It's not great. Secondly, do you guys know what the term hagography means? Yes. I certainly read it a lot in preparing for this. Hagography is like the telling of the life of a saint. And this very much was hagiographic with respect. I mean, Jordan sponsored this thing. It's not a neutral analysis of his time. It's basically him telling his own story. So it's not really a documentary so much as it's a memoir. And if that was on the surface, then there might have been more of a voice for you know all the people who came out of the woodwork to complain after the fact. And then the third thing, there's a question that remains from the documentary that's never seriously addressed or answered. And that is, how did he get to be who he was? Like, why was he so competitive, almost to the extent of being sociopathic? And he's clearly not a sociopath, by the way, I'm not suggesting that. But why did he want to win at any cost? Like, what was it in his background? He seems to have come from a very loving family with very middle class background. Like, there's No reason for him to carry a chip on his shoulder where he feels like he has to be the Napoleon or the Alexander the Great of NBA basketball. And that question was just hanging over the thing the entire time for me. And I I felt like it never got explicitly asked or answered. Well, there just wasn't time in those 10 hours to get to that point. (laughs) Yeah. No, we learned about Steve Kerr's father. Which was fascinating. Dennis Rodman being homeless. I have to say, I did like that structure of it, where they took one episode to kind of focus on one of the key, Phil Jackson, Dennis Rodman, you know, Scotty Pippen. Scotty does not come across well in this thing, by the way. You don't think so? Mm-mm. I feel like in the first episode where they really introduced his character, I was like, oh, yeah, that's why I love Scotty Pippen. You know, I feel like he was very likable, at least in the beginning. He was upset by his treatment in it, that they spent so much time on him giving up in the last four seconds of a game because they weren't going to let him be the one to make the shot and just him being sick, him choosing to have surgery during the season that caused all these problems. To me, it seemed very clear why he was like that. It seemed very clear to me that maybe he didn't like this, but that he wasn't treated the way that he deserved to be treated. So he decided to quit giving as much. Not all the time, but when he felt like he could, it was almost like a power source for him. To just take that away. Well, that's clearly how it was cast in the documentary, for sure. And I think in the interview, he doesn't give you the impression that that's not the case. But later on, Erica, I'm not sure if it's in one of the later episodes where he doesn't come out to play the last, he doesn't play a final because he has back problems or something like that. Right, yeah, it's the last episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Jordan, when they interview him, he doesn't say like, hey man, if you're hurt, you can't play. You know, it's basically like, eh, suggesting like, I would have played through it. That was kind of the message that I received out of it. You know, I think there's something when you have a show that's 10 hours long for just how much oxygen you give to a topic really sets the tone for what's being said. And you can rag on Scotty for episode after episode and say one nice thing about him. And it just doesn't wash away the fact that you're really ragging on this guy, kind of like with Jerry Krause, which who Scotty Pippen says terrible thing after terrible thing about. And at the end, he says, oh, he was probably the greatest GM ever. Okay, well, that sure is magnanimous of you to give (laughs) seven and a half seconds to that after you shit on the guy who's dead and can't defend himself. I think people view documentaries as journalism at their own risk. And Seth, I think there are different kinds of consumers. I, I didn't go into this thinking I was getting anything other than something that Michael Jordan wanted me to see. You know, I don't feel like I had to take any of it all that seriously. And unless he was saying it, I figured everything else was... Someone else that who was you know edited the way that the producers wanted, the way that Michael Jordan would give sign off to. I don't know if other people typically in a documentary get to approve of what's included and what's not. I get the sense that they don't. You get interviewed and hopefully what you say isn't framed in a way or taken out of context or presented to indicate something you don't want. But the only person we're sure was happy with this would have been Michael Jordan. Really, though, because 
I didn't feel like he came off great, honestly. Like in the first few episodes, yes, they set him up for that. And I felt all the wonder and nostalgia I had felt before. I was thinking, and it certainly presented a way that you're supposed to give Jordan credit for being so secure about himself that he can reveal that he's not a very nice person. And he, I guess, was announcing before this came out, like, you guys are going to hate me. I do not come off well in this thing. Now I'm thinking maybe that because we got the part of that that he wanted us to see, but as Seth pointed out, we don't get the cause. We don't get even any speculation on what terrible things in his life have made him such an addictive personality or even any deep introspection about that, that there is something disingenuous about that honesty. What do we get? The only thing we really find out, because Seth, I found myself feeling the same way. I was like, but what is it that's really driving him? You know, we want a good character driven story. And we did get something early on about his father comparing him to his siblings, right? Mm -hmm. To his older, older brother? Yeah. Yeah. But that was really, I think, the only time they didn't really go into it. It makes you wonder if there was other footage that happened or questions that came up about it. And maybe it was too painful to, for Jordan to talk about with his father. But it seemed to me like it was definitely related to his father. And his father was rather antagonistic to him when he was a kid. And he just always felt like he needed to try to be better so he could get his approval. But would you have even believed what he said? Or do you think he would have had enough insight to even try to decode that and present that? I almost would rather just accept the fact that it's not information we're going to have, rather than having some sort of armchair self-psychoanalysis of why he is the way he is. Well, wasn't that what the documentary is about, though? It said it was The Last Dance and it was about the Bulls, and it kind of was, but it was about Michael Jordan. It was about his character. We went on a journey with his character. Or maybe that's up for debate. I feel like he was unapologetically describing why he was the way he was. Not to say what drove his personality traits, but how his personality traits drove his outward behavior and how he was in terms of a public persona and how he was to his teammates. I never thought he was that nice a guy. And my opinion never really changed of him after all this, except that, you know, growing up in Chicago with a bunch of, you know, I would hear the men typically in my life all had like the same opinions that they parroted that they heard of like what a bad guy Scottie Pippen was. And like, of course, it was like known in my house that Michael Jordan was a degenerate gambler and his father was killed because of it. Those are the speculations on the evening news and you read in the Tribune or whatever and you, like no one ever corrects you. So there were like some factual things that I like looking back on now that that probably wasn't the case based on what was presented. But in terms of who he is as a character, I, I think he is exactly who I thought he was and no great insights even though I did enjoy, for the most part, watching the 10 hours of this. I'm not a completionist. Like, if I start a series and I like it for three episodes and then it jumps the shark on the fourth, or if I don't like it, I bail on. This one I had to finish, so I definitely was invested in seeing the outcome. But I would recast the character question, not as, is he an asshole or not, but he's hyper-competitive. That's not even strong enough term to describe it. Everything for him was a competition, right? And he wanted to win at golf. He wanted to win at cards. His entire life was competition. So he defined himself as someone who competes, and the purpose of competition is to win. So there's a sense in which his identity is wrapped up in having to win. And the way the documentary played out for me was that he was in the NBA at a time when it was, as they said in the documentary, a much more physical game and could be dominated more by individual personalities. And it really was like a test of wills. You know, the Pistons were certainly good enough to, to win. You know, when you look at the great teams that were playing at those times, the way the documentary characterizes is it, he just wanted it more. When it came down to it, he wanted it more than everybody else. And he sacrificed everything to meet that need, to fulfill that desire. And I guess when I ask the question, like, you know, what drove him? It's like, what in him is willing to sacrifice all these other things just for the sake of winning? But I guess if you're going to compete in sport, that's kind of, well, I won't say that's the point, but obviously <laughs> the point of competing is to win. So does that mean everybody else didn't want as bad, didn't want to win as badly as he did? That's kind of the way, the frame that we get from this. Isn't it possible he never even asked himself that question, Seth? That's like asking, why do you get up in the morning or why do you breathe? I mean, if it's the way you are, maybe that's just his starting point. It's possible we never would have gotten that from him if we had the opportunity to ask that question. I don't know. 
it's very possible, but I think that's the question that's raised by the whole documentary that I wanted answered anyway. He did say in the episode where they talked about his gambling, he said, no, I don't have a gambling problem. I have a competition problem where I'm paraphrasing, but he admits that his addiction is to be competitive and to win. It is not to gambling specifically. It seems it's also just status and recognition that it is not just a matter of winning. It's that if somebody, at least the way that several of these exchanges were characterized in the documentary was, it wasn't the beating, it was the comment that they made to him afterward. Or even if, uh, you know, when the Pistons finally lose to them, the fact that they slunk off the court and they didn't shake everybody's hand, like a big deal is made out of that and what an insult that was. In their defense, the Pistons are dirtbags. <laughs> so that's well known. Essentially, even the Pistons now, it must be. There's also at that same juncture, it's talking about slights, both real and imagined, that there's a tacit acknowledgement by Jordan in the documentary, for example. Do you remember the sequence? This is the one touch point I had because I lived in Washington, D.C. at the time, or not in D.C., but around D.C., and so the Bullets, as they used to be known. And they play back-to-back games against the Bullets, and in the first game, some young player who nobody's ever heard of before and will never hear of again drops like 36 on the Bulls. and. Jordan says that when they left the court, he looked at Jordan and said, nice game, you know, because Jordan played really poorly. And then the next night, he comes back and absolutely demolishes the guy, just completely, you know, breaks his spirit. And he acknowledges that the guy never said anything to him, or at least didn't say that, and that he was constantly doing things to motivate himself to not just win, but to dominate like a predator, you know, like an alpha male, like just dominate these other players. And It's fascinating, and it's also simultaneously like a little scary. I can't imagine, you know, when you see the interviews with the teammates, thinking about what it must be like to be around somebody like that all the time, especially if you're not that kind of person. Right, and it seemed like they were conflicted about it too. Most of them were like, yeah, he was great, and we won because of it. But also, he yelled at people and demeaned people. Everybody was talking about what a good trash talker he was. Mm Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, you have that side. And on the other, it feels like he was a very fair player of a game, right? So he took the game seriously. When he had a fight with somebody, it was real and it motivated him to play better. It didn't motivate him to just beat people up, right? He was played fairly clean games, not always, but fairly clean. And then when Dennis Rodman came to join the Bulls, he was very supportive and he seemed to welcome him into the fold with open arms and understood him and understood that they needed to give him a little bit of a leash rather than trying to keep him the same exact standards as every other player. So he does seem to have some compassion and and empathy within him, which I think is also, it's an interesting juxtaposition in his character. Some of the complaints had to do with him holding grudges, even to this point that Horace Grant, who is pictured in the, uh, was sort of the pre-Dennis Rodman, Dennis Rodman on the Bulls. I can't remember which of the championships where John Paxson does the final basket, and that's sort of celebrated in that episode as like the thing that won the game. But an article pointed out that, no, actually, there were still a few seconds left in the game, and Horace Grant did like his career height defensive play to prevent the opponents from scoring and thereby, you know, at least taking it into overtime. And that was just, completely left out of the documentary, even though that was just as key a moment as John Paxson making that basket. This was speculated that this is an old grudge from Jordan about him thinking that Grant was the guy that talked to the author that wrote the book that trash talked Jordan so much at the time. It wasn't in this documentary, but Jordan, in his Hall of Fame acceptance speech, trash talked his high school coach who didn't put him on the varsity basketball team. And here he is, he's a NBA all-star and Hall of Famer, and he's ripping on a high school coach for not recognizing the talent of a teenager. I mean, it's a bit extreme, but I guess sometimes you can't have this personality type without having some of the bad things that comes along with it, right? I mean, if he were a nicer guy, yeah, he'd be the nicest guy to never win a championship, and we wouldn't be talking about him. So I think that's part of his unique character makeup, I guess. You're saying he's like the Daniel Day-Lewis of uh, the NBA? (laughs) What does Daniel Day-Lewis have six Oscars? What is it? And he was only in six movies? (laughs) I 
<laughs> pretty much. Yeah, you just have to go all out. You know, you have to go completely in on whatever your task is and you have to live in it. And now that he's out, like he can talk about it a little more objectively. But yes, he does still seem to hold a lot of those grudges. Yeah, particularly with Isaiah Thomas, that who, by the way, is also a very fierce <laughs> competitor and was a tremendous basketball player, even though he was a piston, Brian. Yeah, he was garbage. <laughs> I just have these reflexes. Okay. I'm glad I come from a neutral site. So I'm just picturing that uh, that movie that uh, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis did with Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> Go on, Seth. Space Jam 2. Can you try to Michael Jordan? I drink your milkshake. <laughs> Another interesting thing about this is that it's also the case that Michael Jordan was not like this in college. He was a tremendous basketball player, of course, and a tremendous athlete, but he didn't have the same persona, and he wouldn't have really been permitted to do that at North Carolina anyway under Dean Smith. That's not the way Dean Smith ran the program. But I remember because I you know, was living, like I said, around that area, and the ACC college basketball was a big deal. So I remember seeing Jordan play college ball against the Terrapins and Duke you know, and all those great Duke teams. And he was a winner, but he played in a teen system. And you know, if he had this killer mentality, it didn't show up there. It didn't come until later. So there was something about the transition to the pros and maybe maturation and adulthood that, if not changed who he was, brought out that aspect of him. And there's something to be said, maybe to look back, the overlooked part of the early coaches, you know, who maybe he came from a program where there was a very strong leader. And when he got to the NBA and saw kind of the lack of discipline and the lack of coaching, he felt like he had to impose his will on it. And it's maybe one of the reasons why he reacted so well to Phil Jackson, because Phil is not the same personality as Dean Smith, but somebody who controls, who has control over the entire environment, you know, and has a very specific structure and set of what he believes. Was it Doug Collins? Doug yeah. Collins was the one who who built the whole bulls around Jordan. It was all about Jordan. And maybe that was partially responsible for the personality shift. That was shocking when he was fired. I remember in Chicago that being, like, no one understood why. And we thought it was going to be the demise of the bulls. Doug Collins being fired. Looking back, so funny. <laughs> what are they doing? Did Doug Collins' son go to our high school with us? Mark and I are both from Northbrook, which is a suburb over from Deerfield, which they kept showing the practice facility in. So the Bulls were sort of part of our the texture of our life. I, I can remember occasionally you would see um, like the Bulls going down the Edens to get to the United Center or the old stadium, and they'd have a police escort, and it would just like show up on the news or something like that. And it was just part of our. I think I mentioned in a previous podcast Michael Jordan being at an Indiana Jones movie that I was at. So. It was kind of fun having that be part of our our lives, but I didn't follow basketball that much beyond the playoffs. But I got to say, I did watch a lot of those. I feel like there might have been too much in terms of basketball highlights in this documentary for someone who had seen most of them. Maybe that's because it's not my thing. Like I'll, I've like rewatched Game 7 of the Cubs World Series a bunch of times, and I get really nervous every time I do. And I will, I'm sure I'll keep watching it, but that's more my thing. I could have done with a little less of the highlights, but again, I knew how everything was going to end. And maybe, Mark, you're the best person to ask about that. Not because you enjoy watching basketball, but because maybe you didn't actually sit down to watch those games. Yeah, I think this was a really effective documentary at bringing me someone who has been actively anti-sports. I mean, even just watching the first episode and just you know, dunk after dunk after dunk, then you're just like, okay, this is an amazing human being. This is like watching stupid pet tricks. This is like watching people doing crazy, amazing things on YouTube. I think the appeal is nearly universal for seeing this kind of stuff. And then just getting drawn into the drama of, okay, we've introduced you to some of the characters and including some of the uh, opponents. And now we're going to show you, like, I didn't know what was going to happen in almost any given game. Sometimes they would give it away in the context of the documentary, but like, I didn't even know the basic fact that they had, you know, done a three-peat twice or how they did in the last season. So yeah, this worked very well. You know, it got me wanting to, and I actually did a little today, pulling up old Bulls games. Like if I know in advance, like this was a particularly dramatic one. This is one of the highlighted ones. I could totally see after seeing this highlight that seeing it as a advertisement for my me going to watch the whole game. So as a follow-up then, Mark, did the dual timelines, the way that the story was presented, having the past creep up to the present 
is part of it. And then just the present, their last season. And then their last season be the other timeline that they kept cutting back between. Did you ever lose track? I mean, I know they showed a calendar, but was it easy to keep the thread straight in your head? Or were you getting it all confused by what was going on? 98% of the time, I could follow it perfectly well. I did not like it. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> didn't like it. Hot take from Eric Spires. <laughs> I like most things. I did not like this. No, I did find it problematic. I felt like it was very clunky in terms of how it shot back and forth. It didn't always seem to have a great reason for it, right? So like in the beginning, I was more on board when they were like, we're going to do player profiles with this. So then it made sense to me to go back in time and go for it. Didn't bother me at first, but I started getting a bit more confused about it in later episodes when they were following specific games, because I don't have the best memory for timelines or for what the 90s was from like 90, what 92 looked like as opposed to 97. And to me, a lot of times things looked very similar. And if I missed that, if I was on my phone looking up like, what are Michael Jordan's sons doing now? Right. And I happened to miss that it was telling me what was happening. It took me a second. And even when I got it, I was like, well, I don't really see the point of doing a documentary like that. Did it bother anybody else? I completely agree. It was fine in the earlier episodes when it was focused on the characters. But when they started swapping between season timelines, uh, especially for the seasons where they, they lost, I was like, I just basically pulled up the, there's a Google or a Wikipedia entry. It's like, who were the NBA champions? It's like a list of all that. Because I was trying to recreate the timeline. So I'd say, okay, they're talking about 96 here. And this is when they lose to the you know to this team or when they don't make the finals. Somebody else makes the finals. And I kind of would just tune out for those sections yeah. because it wasn't necessary to build the drama for the final season. They were trying to tell the story of like, okay, there was, especially during the time when he played baseball, like how the Bulls, you could have just said like, he played baseball and the Bulls, didn't win. There's an interesting story there, but that's a different story, you know, to be told. And by going back in time and back, it just, I agree, it was a little clunky. One of the reasons I didn't didn't care for it. I feel like maybe the 98 story wasn't interesting enough to keep going back to. Like, as you said, I liked it in the early, if you started off with that, just like in a film where you start off with basically, here's what's happening at the climax and like, how did we get here? I think I would have liked that better of give us the later stage then go back and just keep going back. I mean, the whole, in other words, you could have a progression forward in time and yet still jump back to 1975 when you're talking about some particular player's childhood or whatever. That like That's fine. But yeah, it would have been less confusing to stop. Just put all that 98 stuff in the last couple episodes. I agree. Dramatically, it made me feel like somebody was like, guys, we're going to do a 10-episode series. And then people are like, oh, crap. Well, well, we still need to fill out this episode. So what can we go back to? I feel like you could have cut out two, three episodes and still gotten what we needed. Yeah, they committed to a length and a format. And by the time it was done, neither one was really perfect, but that's what they were doing already. And so there had to be a past timeline in every episode and there had to be a last dance timeline in every episode. And that's what we got left with. Some of those repeat seasons where they won just weren't interesting enough to talk about. It's hard to not talk about the previous season when, because the jazz was a, a rematch and I think that was worth, but again, to have an entire episode about their fifth championship, like, eh, I don't know about that. Was that the pizza, the hotel pizza? episode? Where yeah. Was- well, and, and that's just it. Like the flu game itself was really interesting, but like, that's the only thing that was really interesting about. Yeah. They wanted to tell that story, so they had to s- somehow find a structure to put, plug it in when they could have just alluded to it. That seems like the most irresponsible piece of reporting, at least according to this article, I think that Brian turned us on to about the actual guy, Greg Kite, who was on The Big Show with Jake Scott and Jordan Monson telling his side of the story, that he says he's the guy that actually made the pizza and remembered all these details, and it definitely was not poisoned. <laughs> And he was a Jordan fan and even named his kid after Michael Jordan. And it just seems like a bare minimum of journalistic investigation would have maybe made it a little less interesting. (laughs) But it just seems like it makes you have such rage against this pizza place 
and Utah that I could just see somebody like a, a Pizzagate vigilante going after this guy. It almost makes me never want to eat at a Pizza Hut again. <laughs> uh, once again, slights real or imagined. I did listen to your sports episode, and I'm, I'm interested in speaking to that a little bit in relation to this, if you guys are game. Yeah. In the episode that you did with it was Dave Revson. Mm-hmm. You were talking about the draw of sports. Like, what is it about sports that allows diverse groups of people to come together and transcend, you know? And, you know, one of the things that's touched on in the Jordan documentary, but it's not super explored except in the context of, like, the dream team and all that, was just his vast international fame. At the time, basketball was not ubiquitous around the world. There were definitely European leagues, but it's not like, you know, there was a lot of great basketball in Asia or Africa or the Middle East. And, you know, he was the most recognizable person on earth by a long shot, I think, who wasn't the president of the United States or, you know, whatever. And similar to like Muhammad Ali, the sport itself was the platform and his transcendence of the sport allowed him to transcend sport itself and become an icon. People just wanted to get close to him, you know, like he was a religious figure. That is a really interesting phenomenon to me that sport seems to be one of those things. You don't get that from writing novels. <laughs> Salman Rushdie and Margaret Atwood don't get mobbed at airports. You know, and maybe part of it is at the time it was the emergence of the league and television and maybe there was a whole bunch of things conspiring. But even Muhammad Ali back in the day, he was just everywhere on earth he went, he was mobbed by people. And Jordan was certainly one of those types of figures. Do you guys have any thoughts about the relationship between what we saw of him and, and the way he approached the sport and the sport itself in the documentary and kind of like how he became that cultural icon? Michael Jordan inspired my eldest brother to want to be a basketball player, which inspired me to want to become a basketball player. Even though I stopped playing after I was 15, I learned so many important things from being on a team, on a basketball team during the era of the Chicago Bulls and these championships. And we were a positive team and we were a team that worked with great teamwork. And I never had an issue if somebody was like a standout point guard, I never had an issue being a Scottie Pippen to that person's Jordan. I feel like they set such a wonderful example as a team. And Michael in particular, gave everybody something to strive towards. You know, we, we saw enough of his story to know that he wasn't a star when he was a kid. He had to work at it. And I think it definitely helped instill a sense of hard work and definitely inspiration for people. And it didn't have to be in basketball. It just felt like something great could happen if you wanted it hard enough and if you tried hard enough. And certainly most of us did not reach any sort of Michael Jordan standards in whatever that pursuit was, but we all became a bit better if we were inspired by it. And in the end, in the last episode, I really felt that the story overall, even with the issues I had with the way it was told or even getting disappointed at times in Michael or, or the other players, the characters, wasn't it just a great story of triumph of putting your mind to something and achieving something really great and then even going beyond what you thought you were going to achieve and, and just doing extra? He was always doing extra. Nothing was ever enough. I think he probably did this world a lot of good that we, we don't even realize. He didn't even mention defeating the Monstars. So, I mean, I know. this world and other worlds. Seth, I really think his success was aspirational in a way that an author's wouldn't be even Stephen King or, you know, someone who has made a lot of money. I mean, he's someone who to succeed by making money or by winning awards is one thing, but, you know, really winning at a sport is granted a team sport, but it is unambiguous in terms of success. You have, you know, defeated all comers and there's no beauty contest aspect to it or popularity aspect to it. You know, you have done the thing on the field of battle. Like metaphorically, of course. And then on top of all that, he is tall and handsome and rich and super charismatic. And when he walks around the room, he's like Al Capone and everyone kind of stumbles over themselves a bit in awe. And you know, his is sort of the word of God in the locker room and in the city of Chicago and wherever he walks. So everyone wanted to, you know, that was the advertising bit, but people wanted to be like him. And even if you had no basketball skill, Say this person 
on this side of the microphone. I never aspired to be a basketball player, but sure, I could I dream of having success like Michael Jordan in my field? Yeah, if I were a harder worker and more talented, sure. But I could see the appeal just universally. I think people like winners and they want to be around them and they want to be like them. That's why I like Mark. I feel like that ethic is a terrible thing for our society. It could be. It's, I'm it's just what, telling you. I mean, just think of how that rhetoric lines up with Trump's. And I couldn't help but think throughout this of Jordan as a as a Nietzschean hero. I'll, I'll say this because Seth is on. Nietzsche was someone whose approach to ethics was that there are lots of ways to be amazing. And he often would refer to Mozart, say, as you know, somebody, if you watch Amadeus or know anything about Mozart, that just seems like an amazing individual that probably you would not want to have as your roommate. Probably it would be really annoying. And Jordan seems lopsided in the same way. So it can just provide this, as you're saying, source of inspiration and this model of, but, you know, even the documentary itself kind of puts it as this is the price he paid for excellence. He neglected other things and you you can read between the lines and a true Nietzschean hero would be able to just leave it all on the court. You'd be able to not carry grudges, that you'd be able to slough things off, that you're such an amazing person that you can just be above all that. And sometimes Michael Jordan definitely seems like that, but as we pointed out, sometimes he doesn't. And he seems that he's a victim of his own competitiveness. And maybe that's why now, you know, I think you could judge a lot about a person by what they do after they gain all this power. Is he like Bill and Melinda Gates? Is he using his fortune for that kind of thing? Is he providing... I'm sure you could find lots of other examples. And I don't really know that much about what Michael Jordan is doing now. I didn't even really know that he's, is he a coach? He's an owner now? He's the majority owner of the the Charlotte Hornets. Okay. Yeah. So I read, uh, just because I read an article about the Hornets. So I just don't know, you know, I would want the the rest of the picture in terms of before I approve him for sainthood. (laughs) There was a little in the documentary about how he wouldn't sacrifice his universal appeal for partisan political gain, even though he believed Jesse Helms was a scumbag, he wouldn't actually go on record and campaign against him. And I'm not sure how I feel about that now, for instance. Oh my God, this conversation could easily go on for many more hours. So one interesting thing about what you just said, Mark, is that we've talked about him being this fierce competitor. Um, How many championships have the Charlotte Hornets won under Michael Jordan's stewardship? Brian, do you know the answer to that? I'm pretty sure... Well, they were the Bobcats and then the Hornets, but zero. Zero, probably right. So obviously his personal success as a player is not translated into success as a owner, which is an interesting dynamic you could explore. And, you know, Erica, you were talking about constantly transcending and one more, one more, one more. And I was thinking about when I was watching it, and as you're saying it, it's making me think about desire is suffering. It just, he's a giant well of unfulfilled desire. And there's no satisfaction, or it's a very, very temporary satisfaction. And the the type of thing he chose to do and the way in which he chose to try to satisfy his desires escalated, but every reprieve was temporary. And I think part of that is, you know, when you think about holding a grudge and all that stuff, if, if winning the championships and being the greatest player ever was enough, then you think you'd be able to let go of all these things and be like, hey, man, you know, that was 20 years ago. We're all adults now. (laughs) And ultimately, what we were competing at was a completely arbitrary game with an arbitrary set of rules and an arbitrary, which makes it all the more amazing to me that we venerate people who excel at completely arbitrary tasks. Like the greatest soccer players in the world, right? Messi and Ronaldo have a certain level of fame globally that's probably similar to what Jordan had because they play soccer. Sampras, Rafael Nadal. There's something about people who excel at a very defined but arbitrary set of tasks that somehow we connect into, but it's not every arbitrary, you know, great engineers don't have that same, great physicists don't get that same, maybe because we don't plug into it. But I guess everybody thinks, everybody plays sport, everybody competes. And so to understand that we plug into that competitive desire and to be able to see somebody who can excel at it and transcend the sport that they're in somehow draws us to them. It's true. Well, and they also have a time limit on things they do, right? Watching competitive writing would be a very different thing. Watching a writer write a book would take a very long time and we would lose interest. But basketball games are short. Sure, the season is long, but 
I think that sports also, it's a package that's easily consumable. And when you have a bunch of other people who really love doing it, then it makes you feel like you're part of something bigger. It was interesting how often in that documentary, people just talked about being Chicago's team. It's your team. And I kept thinking of these marketing buzzwords and like, who came up with that? You know, this is your win, Chicago, and this is your team. It makes you feel like you're a part of something that's much bigger than that. And sports has figured out a way to market their shoes, their clothing, their sport itself in a way that a lot of other jobs aren't able to or just haven't tried to. Seth, I think you're onto something with that relatability piece. There's this weird sort of almost fetish like worship of Albert Einstein, but no one really wants to be him. We know where's an Einstein t-shirt because they don't get it. Not to compare physics to sports, but to look at a different sport and to talk about Tiger Woods. Like golf is kind of a hard sport to watch at length. There's a lot of nothing going on while you're watching it. And it has its moments, but part of the appeal of a great golfer is there are so many people who watch golf who play it. Older people who have no real physical ability, but still golf. And yeah, they don't play with the same exact balls and the same exact clubs and on the same exact courses, but they're playing the same sport. And I think this idea that this guy's doing what I do, but he's doing it better than I'll ever do it. You you can at least relate to that in a way and maybe appreciate it a little bit more directly. Albert Einstein, he's doing physics, just like I'm doing physics in my AP physics class. It's like, is he though? Well, was he? (laughs) Uh, No, obviously not. I think there might be that piece of it. And also just, I think there is a thrill of the sporting outcome. You know, it's kind of hard to remember, but back in the day, there was a lot of hand wringing and thinking that the Bulls were going to lose several of those championships that they won. It seems like it was foreordained by God now, but back in the day, it was nothing seemed given. And in fact, before they got over the hump, there was a lot of thought that maybe the Bulls just were never really going to be good enough to be a championship team. It was, and I think they got at that, the documentary, that Jordan's a great player and a great scorer, and that's all he's ever going to be. Maybe as a final topic here, can we just think about the impact, the legacy that this documentary is going to have, that it was such an event and maybe it was just because of COVID and everybody being cooped up and having little else, you know, like Tiger King. But yeah, I wanted to say to, to Seth about being a completionist. If there were baseball on and we weren't talking about this for a podcast, I probably wouldn't have finished it, but there's nothing on. So this was sports for me. Sorry, Mark, go ahead. I was reading different articles about the success of this means that there's going to be, there's a Magic Johnson one that's being made. There's a Tom Brady docuseries that's been commissioned by ESPN, the same people that did this one. HBO is putting out a Tiger Woods one. There's a discussion of a Kobe Bryant one, and maybe that that doesn't have a good enough script because he didn't like you know end on a big finish. I'm sure they'll do something on his life. You know, given his death, it would be hard not to have some biopic about how awesome he was. Whether it has the sort of narrative scope, you know, any skilled documentarian can find a good place to end the documentary. They didn't talk about Jordan's time in the Wizards on this one. So it's not that his entire life was one championship after another. I can't wait for the uh, Robert Fulford one. I just Googled best croquet players of all time. And uh, Robert Fulford on (laughs) Wikipedia has dominated the sports since the turn of the 90s. But he only makes about 8,000 pounds a year from the sport. He's an alumnus of University of Durham where he was nicknamed Fluffy and... He supplements his sporting career by working in a stone merchants. So that sounds pretty damn compelling. All right. We've now talked about croquet more than hockey on this podcast. That's fabulous. I really hope this doesn't become the trend. I thought this was totally undisciplined and there is no reason to have a 10 hour podcast. Sorry, a 10 hour documentary about <laughs> anyone, including Michael Jordan. Wasn't Ken Burns' whole Civil War documentary only about 10 hours? Slightly more momentous uh, occasion in American history. I might watch a one on Magic Johnson just because he seems like such a charismatic and likable guy and he was also ubiquitous, you know, and there was the whole Showtime era and all that. I don't know that I would watch any of the other ones. So I want to raise two other personalities that I think are brought to mind by the Jordan documentary. The first is Lance Armstrong. So here's a guy who won, overcame odds, right? Played the game the way everybody, and just by sheer force of will, 
and has been demonized for essentially not coming out and saying until later, yes, I used performance-enhancing drugs, but so did everybody else. Right? He became the poster boy for something that everybody was doing. I think there's an interesting comparison to be how Lance has not been vindicated and venerated. And then the second question, and I don't know how to answer this because I'm not emotionally plugged into it, but LeBron versus Michael. Is LeBron this generation's Michael Jordan? There certainly could be a 10-hour documentary series about LeBron after he retires and how he brought championships and drama to many different cities, including his uh, hometown. But I think that's part of the debate that the documentary has spawned is, who's the GOAT? Is it Michael or LeBron? And again, I don't even know that that's a legitimate question to ask, but it's certainly something people want to argue about. You know, going on to your your idea about Lance Armstrong, it would be interesting to have a docu-series on sports figures that are held up on a pedestal that then we knock down. Looking into that trend, we've talked about that with celebrities, of course, and people have done that with cult leaders as well. But wouldn't it be interesting, like Lance Armstrong, Michael Phelps. Tanya Harding. (laughs) Tanya Harding. I don't know, like where there's a big debate about their greatness and why, if they actually are great and why they are great. That could be pretty cool. I will say watching that documentary, the one thing I had forgotten, not really having watched all that old footage, was what a different game basketball was even in the 90s and these guys mugging each other Seth I think that LeBron is playing a different game than Jordan is very hard to compare those two when it just was almost shocking everyone would have been thrown out of the game for fighting and it was just a basketball game that's just what it looked like what was it 20 years ago but all interesting topics all ones I would watch a 30 for 30 on but I just I don't know why I need to see 10 hours of it I mean I'm really hung up on just how long it was Uh, for a previous podcast. I watched a documentary about flat earthers and it was 90 minutes long. And when it was over, I said that was 30 minutes too long. I feel like every documentary should be an hour and anything more than that is a (laughs) failure of editing. So I guess this one was too long by nine hours. I see the Lance Armstrong one is two parts, a two part 30 for 30. So presumably two hours. Well, I'll tell you, I don't want this to be my final comment, but I, I, will, <laughs> I will restrain myself. So here in Austin, Lance is still very much a hero. Like there's plenty of cyclists and people are just, you know, we're all like, hey man, he was just playing by the rules and he did it better than everybody else. And now they're, but my mother, who's from rural Ohio, like still thinks Pete Rose was framed. And there's something about what Erica mentioned about the connection to the city there's something in our reptilian brain about association with place. And I think part of the attraction of sports is this identification with geography and place and home because sports figures are different than like movie stars. You know, people want to be close to movie stars and they want to touch them too. But movie stars are movie stars because the media medium rather makes them so. Whereas in sports, it's something different. It's almost like you're saying, if that can happen for those people, it could happen for me. Or just like, if that person can do that, maybe I could do that, right? There's the aspirational aspect. And then there's the, if that team can win a championship, my team can win a championship. It ties into some notion of community and home and place that's very, very primal in our psychology, I think. And that's why we, th- we always think our home, homegrown heroes are innocent. Don't we see that in politics also, Seth? I mean... There's this home field advantage. The state where a presidential candidate is from tends to go to that person, even when they're maybe that state would normally vote for that party. And it's not like those people's politics have changed. They just like that person. And so they get that bump and maybe they feel like, well, he's up until the most recent election, but he, you know, that's my person and that's who I know. And so they do get that bump they shouldn't get otherwise. But I think since you mentioned it, I thought that your take on Lance Armstrong seemed awfully kind. I feel like he did some pretty nasty things to people who accused him of doing what he ended up doing. But maybe that's what I hear about him in the world versus what you hear about him in Austin, Texas, and that we just have our own different bits of facts that we judge about. Yeah, no, no. I'm not saying that he didn't react poorly. He responded poorly. I'm just saying, like, if you look at the accomplishments in the sport, there's a lot of parallels with the sheer will to overcome and, you know, playing in a, in a particular 
milieu and era that had a certain set of spoken and unspoken rules that's very there are some parallels there but yeah he didn't handle it well i mean he's everybody in austin also thinks he's a huge dick (laughs) because he is and i will admit to my education being from sports radio so and i am totally willing to let that be my last comment well thank you seth thank you guys for having me on i really this was fun thank you erica thank you brian thank you and Thank you for joining us for this is episode number 50. It's approximately our one year anniversary. And without Seth's encouragement, this podcast would not have happened. I could detail the exact technical ways Seth. in which there was encouragement. But uh, the fact that we appear on the Partially Examined Life feed and things like that are entirely because uh, Seth was willing to go along with it. Well, thank you, Seth, for that <laughs> and for joining us. And happy approximatory, Mark. And Erica. Yes, congratulations. Congratulations on your one year anniversary and 50 episodes. That's no small accomplishment. Thanks so much. So, when are you going to start your spinoff podcast? Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any time, Mark. I have a two year old and this and a job. (laughs) A parenting podcast where you just show off your child, just talk to your child on air and just do that through her whole growth so that you have it publicly, no privacy for your child. Parental philosophy with Seth. For 10 minutes, the child just has to sit here and listen to me explain the platonic allegory of the cave. It's perfect. It's all parents will have time to listen to anyway. (laughs) There you go. So long, listeners. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, listeners. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life podcast network, and it's also presented by OpenCulture.com.